welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the podcast. If you haven't noticed recently, we live in a world that is saturated with technology. We have it at our fingertips at home, at work, and everywhere in between, it seems as well, with regards to our commutes and our cars and all the technology those vehicles provide. And so everywhere, everywhere, we're just so used to those touch screens, to the reminders, to the pings, to the apps. Technology is everywhere. And by no means is that a bad thing. It's a very helpful and productive thing. But today we're going to talk about how to master your cell phone. So I'm starting a three-part series called Life in Tech. And over the next couple of months, I'll be tackling a handful of topics, not every week, just three series, three episodes. And today is the first part in that series. So we're going to talk about how to master our cell phone and really dive deep into the benefits of having a cell phone and using it wisely, the drawbacks if we don't use it wisely, and then if we are going to make sure we use it wisely, how to do that. So we're really going to dive into that. And we'll also talk about 12 basic cell phone usage rules. I like to call them mobile manners, I guess you could say. But we're just going to talk specifically about the cell phone or the smartphone today. And we'll leave texting and social media and emailing to another episode. All right, so let's get started. I want to start by sharing a quote from a book that was published in the 20th century, but still holds a lot of relevancy to manners in today's society. And it says, quote, the only bad manners are those which are unkind or which contribute to another person's discomfort. Sounds like that's pretty commonsensical. But a lot of the times we forget that we look at the world through our perspective and our ignorance at times doesn't make us aware of what could be making someone uncomfortable. So hopefully after today's episode, if we aren't already, we'll be more aware of how to find that balance, find that balance between communicating with those we love, because they're definitely a priority in our lives, but also with respecting those people around us. So upon reflection recently, I began to consider those relationships in my life in which I felt a strong, sincere bond. And I began to recall how our time was spent together. So in each of these instances, whether it was with a colleague or a family member or a friend, the person that I considered to be in a close relationship with had chosen to give their full and undivided attention to whatever it was we were talking about. Very rarely, if ever, as I was trying to recall in our last experiences together, had a cell phone even been visible. And if it was, it wasn't being used. On the flip side, those individuals with whom a connection, while maybe attempted, just didn't seem to occur, often held in their descriptor as the presence and frequent use of a cell phone. Granted, there are other factors as well that probably prompted there not to be a connection, but this was a common detail in all of those connections or lack thereof, I guess you could say. So then I began to wonder, since cell phone use and cell phones or smartphones are only becoming more ubiquitous in our modern tech world, how can we become the master of them. How can we become the master of them? And that's what we're going to talk about today. After all, cell phones, smartphones, tablets, and all the different types of technology that we become, have become so, not what I wouldn't say reliant upon, but they become an integral part of our everyday lives on how we communicate, on how we get things done, on how we navigate, right? But we have to choose how to use it effectively. Otherwise, it can do more harm than good. And I want to admit admit freely that I am by no means anywhere near perfect on any of these rules. I am working as hard as you guys are on trying to navigate these. I become frustrated with myself when I recall, oh my gosh, I'm just looking at my phone because I don't know where else to put my eyes. Come on, Shannon, you can do better than that. Pick out a book out of your backpack. Maybe you're going to read a Kindle. That's fine on your cell phone. Sure. But really, how often do I need to look at my cell phone? How often? And so I'm 
I'm a work in progress right along with you guys. So by no means am I <laughs> assuming that I, please don't assume that I have these all down pat. I do not. I absolutely do not. So can look at it this way. If indeed our cell phones can be a tool to improve our lives, but as quickly as we look at them as positively, we can flip them on their head and make it a negative tool that hurts our lives. Look at it like this. If scissors in the hands of a skilled hairstylist can craft magic with any type of tresses, put those same scissors in the hands of a novice or someone who doesn't understand or respect his powers, the results can be devastating and take months, if not years, to rectify. So it really then comes back to us. We have to take that onus. We have to take that responsibility. Just because we have this tool doesn't mean we need to be using it all the time. As someone who is quite reliant on her cell phone or smartphone, I will readily admit that I need to become more self-disciplined, as I mentioned just a minute ago. Unlike many life skills like driving or cooking or showing compassion, these are, these are learned skills that we observe our parents or generations before us doing and hopefully doing well and in a manner that's going to help us successfully navigate when we get to the adult world. But when it comes to cell phone use and how to use it respectfully in public and appropriately, we are kind of learning as we go. There's not really a generation before Generation X that had this experience. So we're figuring out as we go. And even Generation X, I would say a lot of us look to the younger generation on how to use it. But as far as how to use them effectively, we as adults need to come back to that basic foundational rule that we stated at the beginning of this episode. If it brings discomfort to others, if it disturbs the situation, we need to use our common sense and not do it. Because there's going to be a lot of situations that we cannot expect or plan for. We just have to know, using our common sense, that this may not be a good idea to answer my phone. Or I need to figure out a different way to communicate with someone who's trying to communicate with me. So that's why it may seem that the rules are changing constantly. And while there's definitely upgrades constantly on all these tech devices, I would argue that the basics of the rules are pretty much unchanged because it's about how do I maintain respectful relationships with those around me, whether it's people that I'm intimately involved with or just people I run into randomly at the post office or at school. So I'd like today to take, take a look real quickly before we get into the 12 rules to take a look at the benefits and the drawbacks of having cell phones in our lives. Here we go. All right, so the three quick, very general benefits of having a cell phone, we probably all are aware of this, is that it allows us to stay connected regardless of distance, regardless of situation or scenario. We are able to stay connected and that is huge and profoundly improved beyond what it has been for centuries. The second one is that it allows us to be alerted to emergencies in a timely manner. That is, that is priceless. Life-saving causes us not to stress out so that we know if someone's okay or not, those kind of things. And the third one is that it's kind of like having a Swiss army knife at your disposal. I mean, you have a map for directions with your GPS. You have a camera, a really good camera, and some of these more advanced phones. You have your music. You have your planner. You have your contacts. You even have your wallet nowadays with Apple Pay and other devices. And you even have these, all these endless apps to help you be more productive throughout your day. And then beyond that, you have access obviously to internet with regards to answers to any question you may have that you're not certain of, or if you want to look up anything at all at any time. So those are huge benefits, absolutely and undeniable benefits as to why it could absolutely help and improve our lives. But let's look at the drawbacks. I was recently reading an article by David Brooks in the New York Times, and it was very thoughtful and very, oh, anyway, I'll leave a link on today's show notes, Podcast 30, to have you look at it. Because even though I'm not a mom, I am a teacher and I'm an adult that just sees that college is an opportunity or after one graduates, students have an opportunity to really step away from the nest and grow their own wings. And as we all know, if we all did that, it's not easy. There are times when you initially leave where you're like, I want to go home. Or maybe you don't want to go home, but you're like, this may not have been the right place for me. And what he talks about in this article is this idea of how cell phones and this constant ability to stay connected can be a detriment 
because the student and even the parents, they may cleave to the student and not allow them to step away and, and change and grow and have a healthy separation that is vital to the student's or the child's maturity into adulthood. So it's worth reading. It's, I, like I said, I provide a link on the blog underneath drawbacks on today's show notes. Check it out. But again, one of the drawbacks or detriments of having the ability for constant communication, again, ability, it's our choice to do it. It's our choice to do it. The second drawback is that it hinders intimacy. It can get in the way of romantic relationships, friendships. I mean, it, it, it puts up a barrier and it prevents someone from being vulnerable, from going there, from being honest and talking about something that's maybe uncomfortable, not necessarily in a bad way, but just something that's very revealing and honest. And it can hurt intimacy. Absolutely. Third one, it can cause accidents, whether to the extreme with regards to cars and fatalities, or simply just walking. And I mean, these are comical when you watch them, but the person has to experience a lot of pain. I mean, there's, there's clips and videos on, on the newscasts of people texting or using their phones and not even aware that they're about ready to step off a curb and then they fall down or they run into a pole because they're looking down. Ouch. This is not a good thing, people. And then the fourth one is the likelihood or the more likelihood of a security breach. Again, we have so much on our phones. So much of our uh, money now is on our phones if we choose to have it there. So much of our information, our personal information is there. So if we happen to have an absent-minded moment and leave our phone somewhere, it's not necessarily just about calling up our credit card companies. It's about doing a lot of other self-preservation to stop our identity from being taken from us momentarily. So it can cause a lot of unnecessary stress and angst. All right. So those are the four drawbacks. So when it comes to respectful use of our cell phone, whether it be in public or around people, there's an ironic finding that was discovered recently in an Intel study that was shared on, um, Emily Post's website. And it says 80% of Americans surveyed were annoyed when they saw an inappropriate use of tech gadgets. However, the same group of people said that 70% of those people said that they admitted doing just those, those types of behaviors that when observed in others was inappropriate. So the question is, why do we persist? If we know that that is inappropriate, why do the majority of us keep doing it? It's laughable if it wasn't so agitating, right? The same study found that 92% wish that people would practice better cell phone etiquette. So why don't we? Perhaps, perhaps it comes back to that foundation of what we know is proper. Sometimes it really is easier to recognize it in others than it is in ourselves. After all, if our spouse calls or our child or our best friend, we rationalize that taking a call is okay because we hold them as a priority, a top priority in our lives. But here's the catch. The people around us, the strangers around us in the grocery store or at the waiting room, the people around us are affected by our decision to pick up that phone. And we must take into consideration that we aren't making a decision that only affects us. Granted, if it's an emergency, that is different. But if our child, our parent, or our friend simply needs to hear our voice, there is voicemail or texting for that. While simply adhering to the, the simple advice of being aware of how to use our technology and impacts those around us, sometimes we need more specifics. Sometimes we need to be reminded and sometimes we honestly were never taught and simply don't know. After all, we weren't born with a cell phone attached to our ear. Knowing how to effectively and respectfully use it to foster healthy, thoughtful relationships is a learned behavior. So after the break, I'm going to take a one minute intermission. After the break, we're going to dive into those 12 rules of mobile manners. I'll see you on the other side.
right, welcome back. So now let's dive into specific rules about mobile manners. Now, number one is the top of my list for safety reasons. I think it's probably the top of most of your guys' list as well. It's simply no driving while using a phone or any tech gadget. Sounds pretty commonsensical again, but this is also bigger than just not being, um, or this is bigger than just being kind and, and thoughtful. This is about safety. So number one, don't drive and text people. <laughs> Number two, and this one's a tricky one. So we're gonna go a little deep in this one. Avoid bringing phones where you shouldn't use them or to do so would be considered uncouth. Now, we could probably have a really long conversation about all the places that people shouldn't be using a cell phone and I think it's gonna depend on certain scenarios again, but here's a general list, general list. Restaurants, places of worship, a library, theater, museums, school, lectures, waiting rooms, funerals, weddings, live performances, trains, planes, and meetings. And, and part of the reason I say number two, don't even bring it is so therefore you're not even tempted to grab it or cause you know, it's going to ding, you know, it's going to go off and you don't want it to, and you're not planning on answering it. But if you know it could happen or you might forget, Oh, well, we got to add one more, add the movies to that one too. Sorry about that guys. So number two, add movies to that list. But yeah, if you know that you shouldn't even be answering, you don't even want to answer it. Don't even tempt yourself by bringing it. But number three kind of just tempers it a little bit. If you must have your phone with you, switch it to silent or to vibrate. And when it rings or vibrates in this case, leave the room to take the call, leave the room to take the call if you need to take it. The key thing is just to know where it's okay and where it's not. And that's a general list. I'm sure we could add a few more to that. Number four is to give the person who is in your physical company, your full attention, to give them your full attention, refrain from texting someone else while you're talking to someone. There's nothing like feeling second man or low man on the totem pole. than if the person you're trying to talk with responds to the text rather than to continue the conversation with you. And while they may not believe what you're thinking, they may not believe that, that scenario at all, it's perception. It's what's being communicated via your behavior. Number five is to be mindful of your volume and your voice projection. Oftentimes we forget how loud our voices are. And just even if you can use your cell phone in this particular scenario, temper your voice. And usually if you're speaking too quietly, the person on the other end will tell you, but that's rarely the case, rarely the case. And if you can't talk very loud, then let them know you'll just call you back or don't answer the phone at all and simply text back real quickly and say, I'll call you when I'm available. Number five was be mindful of your volume and voice projection. All right, number six, this one I learned the hard way, but I'm, it will forever remain in my memory. <laughs> so it worked. It worked. Number six, refrain from placing your cell phone on the table. Now, this may be a hard habit for many of us to break, especially if we're by ourselves having a cup of coffee and we're doing business. Now, that may be an exception, obviously, but I can remember, and I, I can remember I was in Paris a couple summers ago and I was having lunch by myself. I had just, I was in the Marais and I was just finished up with some business and I was starving and I was so excited. I was able to sit outside. The sun was out. It was stunning and beautiful. And I think I was having um, a caprese salad. So it was drizzling the olive oil on the mozzarella and the tomatoes. And my cell phone was to the right of me on the table because, you know, I wanted to collect my thoughts and just kind of, and the waiter was very frank and did not apologize. Your tape, your phone needs to be in your purse. <laughs> I was, he wasn't, I wouldn't say rude. It was just very matter of fact, like commonsensical. And I, having getting to know the French culture even more, I could have kicked myself. I knew this, I knew this, but I was just so tired and so hungry. And it was habit. It was habit. It's more allowable as I would... I would imagine most of you would agree here in America to do that. But you know what? It was a good idea. I savored that food so much more, so much more. And I, why wouldn't I want to savor that moment? I'm in Paris. Are you kidding me? <laughs> so a quick direct lesson that needed to be learned by moi. And I'm glad I did. So number six, refrain from placing your cell phone on the table. 
Number seven, allow voicemail to do what it's designed to do. If you're in a situation where you can't answer your phone, that's why there's voicemail. That's why it's there and you can check it when you're able. Number eight, speaking of voicemail, when you leave a voicemail, keep it short, but say more than just call me. Let them know, whoever you're leaving the message for, what the call's about and why you need them to call you. Even if it's as simple as, I just wanna hear your voice, say that so that your partner doesn't think something has happened. But the biggest ambiguous statement on a message for texting or voicemail is call me. And you're like, hmm, is this urgent? Do I have to leave the meeting now to call you or can it wait? So just help them out, ease their angst, and let them know. Simple, short message, but to the point. Number eight. Number nine, don't make people wait while you are finishing a phone call. In other words, make sure that you end any phone call you are on before engaging with anyone else in person, whether it be at the checkout stand at the, at the grocery store, put your phone down before you even get in line. Cause you know, inevitably that phone conversation is going to continue and the line's going to move faster than you expected. And there's just something about having someone on a cell phone and someone else doing a service for you where you could easily have a very pleasant, simple conversation with them. And when you're not, it just speaks to your presence, I think. And I have been, I will definitely put myself on the naughty list for this. I've done this a time or two and I felt guilty. And I was like, Shannon, that wasn't very cool. I, and it was usually because I was in a, in a conversation with someone. I didn't want to be rude to them by getting off the phone. But when I look back on it, I could easily have said, you know what? I'm going to finish this conversation when I get out of the store, I'll call you right back. So easy to do, and it just puts your presence, the person's presence that you're with, at the forefront, even if it's just someone you don't know. It simply speaks of your awareness and your appreciation of that situation. Number 10, use speakerphone respectfully, and I'm a big advocate on this one. There's nothing worse than not realizing you're on speakerphone and saying something kind of private or intimate, and everyone hears it everyone hears it. Or you don't, or maybe it's even just a funny little, I don't want to ruin the surprise. And I just ruined the surprise because everyone now knows in that room. So if you're going to put someone on speakerphone first, ask if you can. And then when you do let them know, and when you take them off, also let them know as well. Number 11 is do not share personal information or details in public. Even if you can be on your cell phone in public, just be aware of ears, not that people are going to do anything with that information, but just more of a having or maintaining the privacy for yourself. And number 12 is respect the 10 feet rule. Earlier in our list, I mentioned that if you have to take a phone call to step out of a room, but sometimes stepping out of a room is not possible. The room is huge or there is no room. It's just one room. If you cannot get out, then at least separate yourself from the group or the crowd by 10 feet or more if you can. And it simply just indicates that I will let you guys continue what you're doing, be respectful to that situation, and also being respectful to the person whose phone call you're taking so that you can have a, a conversation where you're focused on whatever is being said. So that's number 12, respect the 10 feet rule. So it's interesting to point out that in a study done in 2012 conducted by the Journal of Social and Personal Relationships, they reported that, quote, the mere presence of our cell phone paradoxically holds the potential to facilitate as well as to disrupt human bonding and intimacy, end quote. We can master these amazing devices if we choose to. We can. Often, as I observe my teenage students, I am quickly reminded how cell phones are an escape, a safe place to go when we feel uncomfortable or are seeking validation. It takes a strong, secure person to put the phone away and walk with their head up into a room of people they don't know. It takes a strong, secure person to look someone in the eye and have a conversation with them that's, un that's uninterrupted and perhaps makes them vulnerable. But that's when connections happen. To allow our modern advancements to cause us to regress rather than progress towards a better life is something we must own because the device doesn't have such a significant power unless we allow it to be taken away from us. And now that we talked about the 12 mobile manners, 
let's talk about some simple ways that we can become the master of our cell phone. Number one, practice self-restraint and self-control. Recently in a Time Magazine um, article, they shared a study by the Journal of Personalities, which revealed that those people that exercise self-control reported having better good moods or more good moods and fewer bad moods. And what it really came down to that it was, it was just as much about avoiding temptations as it was finding ways not to be tempted in the first place. Put this idea into practice so that you aren't reaching for your phone. So you don't have to make the decision to not reach for your phone. When you're driving, leave that phone in your purse. When you are at a meeting, leave it in your locked office. When you are having dinner with your significant other, turn it off completely. So number one, how we can master it is simply by showing self-discipline. Number two, have clear priorities. If your relationships are a priority to you, refuse to allow those minor alerts, pings, rings, or tweets that will naturally draw our attention away. Refuse to let them interrupt an intimate conversation. There is a silence button on our phones for an option. We need to use it. We need to use it. Number three is to set and respect boundaries. And I speak of boundaries, not only setting them for ourselves, but also setting boundaries for others, letting them know where our boundaries are so that we know when we are going to use our phones and when we're not going to use our phones. We need to teach that to ourselves, but also teach that to other people on how they respond to us. So often we have to teach our boundaries to others as they will simply proceed on what they allow in their own lives. And maybe it's the same, but a lot of the times it's not. And it's not that their way is wrong. It's just that it's different. And we need to communicate that this is what works for us. And I will respect what you set, but I need you to respect what I've set for myself. But until we make that clear what we need, they will continue to cross that line. So we need to teach people how to treat us and respond to us. Number four, we need to use the full capabilities of our phones. Our phones are amazing, amazing technology. I still know I don't know half of what my phone can do. I'm still figuring new things out and I get so excited. Woohoo, it can do this. I didn't know. But for example, use your do not disturb option on your phone. Preset it to not ring at a certain time at night. My, you know, have it set start at nine or 10 o'clock at night and it won't allow rings to come through until say six in the morning. Now, the beauty of this is that it will allow your favorites to ring through or text through. And so you can designate who those people are so that you can rest assured that the important calls or texts will get through, but not unnecessary pieces of information or numbers you don't recognize. Another thing you can use is simply turn off unnecessary notifications. A lot of the times our phones are preset to have notifications for so many different apps on our phones and we don't even know they're on. Simply go into our phone settings and we can turn those off so that we only get the notifications that we want that will be helpful to our lives. And with all the apps out there, there's even apps to help us monitor our phone usage. For example, there's one called Moment, and there's another one called Break Free, and I will provide links to those on today's show notes. There's also one to help us really shut off our phones and have it just be a calm, meditative moment, and that's simply called Calm, and I'll leave a link to that on today's show notes as well. Again, the key is you. What will you allow? Master your phone. Don't let it master you. As of January 2014, the Pew Research Center shared that 90% of American adults have a cell phone, and of those, 58% of adults have a smartphone. These numbers only reflect, reflect adults, and we know that many children and young adults have them as well. Even if we feel our behavior is unobtrusive to others when we pick it up to answer a phone, What we model speaks volumes to how and when a cell phone can be properly and respectfully used. I am by no means perfect. And I often find myself, as I've mentioned earlier in today's episode, breaking one or two of these rules from time to time. But just as the first study I shared at the beginning of the episode revealed, I will admit to getting slightly agitated when people around me aren't aware of their disturbance to others when they use their phone in a public place that is asking for calm or quiet or our full attention. We may each be simply a small ripple in a grand ocean of our technologically loving society, but 
it has to start somewhere. So why not with us? Why not? You can get all of today's show notes for how to master your cell phone on the blog at www.thesimplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 30. And uh, do stay tuned because I have a petite pleasure that I think, I think you'll enjoy. It's about uh, a show that one of my readers reminded me, you need to recommend this to us on the blog. You need to recommend us. And that I shall do after the break. I'll see you on the other side. This past fall on the weekly This and That, which goes live every Friday morning, I suggested a CBS uh, drama that aired on, that airs on Sunday, every Sunday, starring Taya Leone. And at the time, I was optimistic it would be a worthwhile series, but I wasn't sure, but now I am. And as such, it was brought to my attention by a reader this past January when she emailed me to mention she was shocked that I hadn't recommended this show yet, which is Madam Secretary. She is absolutely correct. Madam Secretary is worth recommending, and here is why. Well, yes, we have had three female Secretary of States, Madeleine Albright, Condoleezza Rice, and Hillary Clinton. Don't jump to any conclusions. Taya Leone's character, Elizabeth McCord, is not patterned after any one former female Secretary of State, but rather, based on my observation, is a combination of attributes which are undoubtedly required by any person chosen to be five steps away from the presidency, be they man or woman. A former CIA operative and a college professor, McCord is tapped to step into her new position as Secretary of State after her predecessor was killed in a plane crash. There are many aspects to the show that draw me in each Sunday evening at 8 p.m., In fact, as I tape this, the show is two hours away from airing and I can't wait. I'm going to sit down, grab a cup of tea and just relax. But some of the things that I love about the show are, for example, behind the scenes look at the DC politicking that goes on. I understand it's fictitious, but still it has to be drawn from somewhere. Also, Elizabeth's choice of professional attire and the quick wit and humor that they include to balance the seriousness of such a position with with diplomatic relations. But what has struck me is highly applaudable. For a drama on primetime TV is their restraint when it comes to Elizabeth and her husband, Henry's relationship. As a professor in theology, Henry and his wife Elizabeth, now regularly working with POTUS, they present an egalitarian camaraderie rather than a man who is threatened by her success and a woman who tries doggedly to shed her femininity. This is not the case in Madam Secretary. With high-level conversations with their children, the show attempts to reveal that communication, clear, honest, often uncomfortable conversation is crucial, just as it is with diplomacy. But the benefits are profound. Stealing perhaps a page from the Huxtables from the 80s, but nonetheless, it raises the bar and allows international turmoils to, to become the drivers of the plot not the trivial relationship spats that often are spun from insecurity and poor communication to drive a plot that isn't worth its weight in gold. Bravo to the writers for crafting a family show that all ages can watch, enjoy, and learn from. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each Monday's podcast, where I'll recommend a book, a film, a recipe, or from time to time, introduce you to an expert who offers insight into how to live simply luxuriously. Anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, stop by the blog, thesimplyluxuriouslife.com, or pick up the book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, A Modern Woman's Guide. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour. Bonjour.